Okay, so we're um, going to start <clears throat> with our speakers this evening. And we're going to start with Andy Worthington, author and filmmaker of The Guantanamo Files, the story <clears throat> of 774 detainees held in America's illegal prison. And then we'll move on to Candace Gorman, who is an attorney for one of the detainees. And then Deborah Sweet, National Director of World Camp Wayne. We will then open it up for <coughs> questions and answers. And we'd like this evening to be more of a conversation and, and dialogue, because we really do want to get in and, and wrangle about how are we going to shut down Guantanamo once and for all and end indefinite detention. So let's welcome Andy Worthington. Thank you. Am I using this? Is that okay? Can we all do it? Okay. Uh, well, thank you for listening to me singing there. It's just branching out, trying everything. If we don't get Guantanamo clothes, the next thing I'll be juggling in a clown suit. <laughs> <coughs> Um, <clears throat> we have some uh, we have some good news from Guantanamo today um, because five prisoners were released, uh, five Yemenis, and four of these men were sent to, to Oman and one man was sent to Estonia. Um, if you know about the story of Guantanamo at all, I think you would appreciate that Yemenis being free from the prison is, um, has always been one of the real uphill struggles. Um, even uh, when President Bush, in his second term, was uh, releasing loads of prisoners, um, even he didn't release many Yemenis because um, the United States establishment as a whole has always considered Yemen to, be, uh, uh, to have an unstable security situation, although they didn't really feel that it was safe to release prisoners there. Um, President Obama, who in his first few years was uh, managing to release prisoners without too much confrontation with Congress, um, in 2009 uh, released uh, a Yemeni prisoner who um, had won his habeas corpus petition um, and then released a group of Yemenis in December 2009, seven men if I remember correctly. Uh, much to the consternation of, um, of various Republican senators, but we're used to that, they do it regularly and express their consternation about releasing people from Guantanamo. What followed, from what I understand, what followed is that there was a horrendous uh, U.S. cruise missile strike on a, on a civilian gathering in Yemen that killed a large number of women and children. Um, and in response to that, there was an attempt to uh, blow up a plane bound for Detroit on Christmas Day 2009 by a Nigerian man recruited in Yemen with a really rather inept um, bomb in his underwear, uh, which failed to detonate. Um, so the plot was foiled. <clears throat> when, I was a, when I was a younger man and we faced terrorism threats in the UK from the IRA, we didn't, uh, we didn't have our Prime Minister standing up every time a terrorist plot was foiled. There was usually an attempt to downplay it. The way things happen these days, everything is an excuse for hysteria. Uh, the response to this was a demand that, um, that, that the release of all Yemeni prisoners and people for release of Guantanamo be brought to an instant halt. Um, and President Obama did impose a ban. Um, Congress um, also in the years that followed regularly imposed a ban on releasing or attempted to ban the release of prisoners to any country that they regarded as dangerous. President Obama's ban stood um, until May 2013. And those of us who, are, who have been involved in the campaign from Guantanamo will remember that in May 2013, President Obama's response to people's questions about Guantanamo came about because in February 2013, so nearly two years ago, the prisoners embarked on a prison-wide hunger strike um, in protest at the, um, the way they were being treated by the uh, commander at Guantanamo, um, a man called Colonel John Bogdan, um, who was uh, ransacking their cells and manhandling the copies of the Koran and generally behaving in a way that was uh, that was bound to create serious unrest in the prison. Uh, but also because, uh, because they were in despair at ever being freed, the ones who'd been approved for release, um, or for the ones who hadn't been approved for release, they were in despair at ever receiving anything that resembled justice. 
They embarked on a hunger strike, and I'm glad to say that after um, quite some time of general indifference from the mainstream media, uh, not just in the US, but globally, um, it was as though um, a press release had appeared magically in, in, in newsrooms across the world that said, remember Guantanamo? And then laid out why it was such a monstrous um, aberration of justice and why the fact that it was still open was something that the media should care about and why President Obama, however much he was blaming Congress for things, um, was the President of the United States and had the power to do something about it. Because, it. because across the world, the world's media did suddenly all behave as though they'd woken up after a long sleep and, and went, oh, that place went down, well, yeah, yeah, and started criticizing the President. Um, they weren't the only people. The EU was critical. Uh, the United Nations were critical. Uh, there were critical editorials in key United States newspapers like the New York Times. There was, um, there was, there was very robust criticism from Senator Carl Levin, who uh, was the head of the Senate Armed Services Committee. I'm very sorry to say that he recently retired, um, because he really did a lot of work trying to get retirement um, And President Obama responded to this, this you know, tsunami of criticism by promising finally to do something about it. It wasn't that he hadn't done anything about it when, in, in previous years. You know, we, we all remember, I'm sure, that he came to office and on his second day in office promised to close Guantanamo within a year. He did release prisoners in those first two years, but when he was facing obstacles in Congress, for, nearly, for a period of nearly three years, he sat on his hands and refused to do anything about it. Um, even though there were provisions in the legislation that would have enabled him to bypass Congress if he wanted, he chose not to do so. And only five men were released in a period of nearly three years. So in May 2013, when he was finally obliged to do something, he said, okay, I'm going to start releasing prisoners from Guantanamo again. I'm going to drop the ban on releasing the Yemenis. Um, I'm going to appoint two envoys to assist with the closure of Guantanamo, one man in the Pentagon and one man in the State Department. And, you know, from that time onwards, we had uh, 11 prisoners released in 2013. We had 28 prisoners released last year. And now we have these five men released. So that really, by any measure, is progress. Um, I, always, I always think that he's only as good as the last releases. Um, that as soon as prisoners have been released, I'm thinking, who's next? Is it all going to grind to a halt again? Um, you know, because, you know, that's what, that's how we have been made to feel, understandably, it, it's true that we always think it's, it's, going to, it's, it's just going to grind to a halt. Something's going to become politically difficult again. I can't imagine how awful it is for the men in Guantanamo who think that they're going to be freed and don't get freed. And on many occasions have been told they were going to be. And the fundamental problem of all those men who were approved for release by the Obama administrations, um, Guantanamo Review Task Force, a high-level review body in 2009, and who were told, you know, when we can facilitate it, you guys will be leaving here, we don't want to hold you any longer. And yet, they're held year after year after year after year. Um, so, I'm especially pleased about yesterday's releases because, um, as I'm sure anyone, everyone here is aware, um, there were some terrible terrorist attacks in Paris and there has been wall-to-wall um, reporting as a result of that. I use the word reporting, I should put it in inverted commas really, because much of it hasn't consisted of serious analysis of what's going on or why. Um, what happened is clearly absolutely horrible, um, but anyone who tries to draw uh, parallels between the situation in Paris and the situation in Guantanamo, which a number of Republican senators have done very recently by suggesting that uh, there should be a, a, a ban on releasing prisoners. As I say, the stuff that they do at least once a year and, and, ge and generally more often than that. But people are fundamentally missing a point. I, I've been talking about it a bit over the last few, few days and we, we had a protest earlier and I made a point of saying that the, probably the people on earth who are least connected to what happened in Paris are the people in Guantanamo because they have been hermetically sealed away from the rest of the world for 13 years with barely any contact with anybody under any circumstances. So how it's supposed to be, how it's supposed to make sense that a ban on releasing people from Guantanamo um, is going is to help in any way with anything to do with terrorist attacks in, in Paris is beyond me. 
And I think, I think it's important to find ways to challenge this. Um, I was talking to Deborah on the way down. We've been talking about a few instances recently of um, but Jeremy Scarhill, for example, I heard yesterday complaining about the people who pretend to be terrorism experts who are all over the mainstream media. And they're not terrorism experts. They're, uh, they're you know, overpaid biggots who work for right-wing think tanks and foundations. And yet they're all over the media and people who can actually point out things that I think are, are important and relevant and not. Um, so, you know, if you, if you get asked about this, you know, do, 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 th it's the, it's the only, it's the, the best point I've been able to come up with recently is how on earth do you think people who have been cut off from the world could have anything to do with anything? Um, you know, I think that's been disgraceful. So I, I think it's been, I think, uh, obviously, releases from Guantanamo are things that are in motion for a while. Um, and, and, and this was, obviously, I, I imagine this was planned before, but I, I would like to congratulate the administration for pressing ahead with it. And basically, you know, snubbing those Republican senators who were um, getting all hysterical over the last few days. And I hope, that we, I hope we'll see more of it. We've certainly been told that more releases are planned. Um, I don't know quite how, how much is planned for all of the, the men who are still held who have been approved for release. So it was um, 59 men, it must now be 54 men. And 47 of those men are from Yemen, and the others uh, include Shaka Arma, um, and people from a handful of other nations. And, and these 47 men from Yemen who um, new countries are going to have to be found for them. It was clear before Paris that the Obama administration had no intention of sending any men from Yemen back to their home country because of their over, overarching view of the dangerousness of Yemen. And with, with the allegations that are flying around at the moment, which I haven't seen substantiated, but um, it's obviously going to make that even more difficult. Did Peru or some other country say we'll take them? Peru? Uh, yeah, some other country Uruguay, said that they would Uruguay. take Uruguay. them. Well, Uruguay has taken some, oh, some of the men before okay. Christmas. And, and undoubtedly, you know, the US representatives are talking to other countries in Central and Southern America. What we hear from the administration that seems to be very confident about, about them being able to find homes for all of these guys. So maybe, you know, maybe there really is um, a lot going on behind the scenes. I very much hope so. Should there be any delay in the release of these prisoners who have already been approved for release for at least five years, then you know, all of us need to be making as much noise as we can about that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that that's not everybody who's held at Guantanamo. So there, there is another 68 men held at Guantanamo. Roughly 10 of those are facing trials or have had trials. Um, so that's 58 that we're down to who um, who are in two categories, essentially. Some of them are men who were put forward for, recommended for prosecution by the task force that President Obama appointed in 2009. Um, but since then, um, the already discredited military commission trial system at Guantanamo has collapsed even further. Um, what, what credibility it has is hanging on by a string, I think, now. There have been a number of rulings in the um, really quite conservative appeals court in Washington, D.C., um, overturning the convictions of some of the handful of men who've ever been convicted in the military commissions, which really isn't many, um, on the basis, as, a, as everybody who was paying attention knew, that the war crimes for which they were convicted were not war crimes, were not recognized as war crimes, were invented by Congress. Um, so, so the military commissions are, you know, uh, are um, a joke, a rather grim joke, but a joke nonetheless. Um, and so a lot of the men who were put forward for prosecution are never going to be tried. Um, so some of them join another group of men that we all need to be concerned about, because these are men who the task force told President Obama were too dangerous to release, um, but that insufficient evidence existed to put them on trial. Um, every time I say those words, really alarm bells go off in my head, because um, that's not, you know, that's not the basis on which we understand justice is, uh, is you know, I mean, um, imagine if you were arrested by the police and they were, they were, um, you know, they wouldn't put you on a trial, they just kept you in detention forever because, you know, fortunately we have those kind of protections. We don't have protections against other kinds of um, misconduct and wrongdoing by the police or by the judicial process in this country, but, you know, on that basis, um, we, we don't have the same thing going on. 
And President Obama took these recommendations that were made and passed an executive order in March 2011, which I think is one of the big black marks against him, honestly, because he approved the detention of this limited number of men. Um, and that was the first thing that he did that wasn't inherited from President Bush. He's inherited a legacy issue from President Bush. I think that's clear. I think, you know, one, one very good way of understanding that is that he has refused ever to send anyone else to Guantanamo. But, but he himself, in dealing with the disposition of these prisoners, signed his name to an executive order approving the, the detention of these men without charge or trial on the basis that they were too dangerous to release, but insufficient evidence existed to put them on trial. He, um, he tried to sweeten that very bitter pill by promising review boards for these men so that their cases would be checked on to see whether they still constituted a threat in the absence of the evidence to put them on trial. Um, and those finally got underway in the fall of 2013, uh, two and a half years after he promised them. They are moving slowly, but they have reviewed the cases of nine men uh, since the fall of 2013, and in six of those cases, these men have been approved for release. Two of them have been released, Q80 and Saudi, the other four are Yemenis, so they join, you know, that big queue of Yemenis. Um, but that's, you know, again, another form of progress. The, the reason that, um, you know, we need to keep an eye on that, and we need to, to put pressure on these men um, to have their, their cases reviewed and for, um, for the government to really put up a good case if it wants to carry on saying that people that can be too dangerous to release without the evidence is that it's that problem with the evidence. If it's not evidence, then what is it? And what it is, is a collection of information, mostly, I would say, derived from the prisoners themselves or from their fellow prisoners. Some of it, in the, in the cases of a lot of the guys, on, on capture or shortly after capture, um, often by the Pakistani authorities, and you know, these men were treated very poorly at the time. But a lot of it in US custody, and a lot of it over years at Guantanamo, not just at Guantanamo, in black sites, in all kinds of detention centers. Prisoners were shown pictures of all kinds of other prisoners that um, I've heard it referred to frequently as the family album. Um, that's what they called it. And they wanted to know, either they wanted and prompted to know what people knew about the people in the pictures, or they were told what they thought they knew and wanted the confirmation. And you can imagine the different ways. Um, one, very obviously, is torture, and um, I don't think I need to enunciate all the ways that uh, torture is torture. You, I just bought this today, which is the printed out version of the classified summary of the torture report. Um, torture is torture no matter how much John Yoo wrote sneaky memos pretending that it wasn't. Um, people were abused in ways that doesn't rise to the level of torture, but with, you know, which constitutes inhuman or degrading treatment. Um, some people weren't necessarily abused in that manner. They were bribed. People were bribed at Guantanamo to say who they knew in these photos to confirm what the interrogators were saying to them, to tell some nice stories, buy whatever they wanted, a Big Mac, a packet of cigarettes, all kinds of stuff. Other people were just worn out by the treatment. Um, so I know a journalist who had um, interviewed a former prisoner. Um, we had looked at the um, supposed claims that he had made that are in the files. Um, if you haven't looked at the files that were released by WikiLeaks, the, the former classified military files, on the prisoners, then please go and have a look. Because everybody's named in there. And what the right wing, the, what the lunatic right wing media does is they treat everything in there as though it's, as though it's true. Once you start to examine it a bit, it all falls apart. And it's, it's enlightening to go and read it. But, um, but um, you know, so, so all of these. Um, different forms of, of, of lies, and what this guy said was that in his case, um, you know, my journalist friend specifically said, okay, these are, these are in the files of various people, we just like to know, you know, did you have any grounds for saying this, was this, was this true about this person, when you said this about, and he said, look, at a certain point, I just stopped resisting them, and I said yes to everything, so I have no idea what it was that I said, because I said yes to him. Um, and he's clearly, you know, not the only person by any means. Um, other former prisoners that I've spoken to have said that, you know, even if they were trying hard not to do it at all, there were
the circumstances in which they did. Some of them tried hard to only implicate themselves falsely, but other people, of, of course, resulted, to, you know, had to, had to eventually, under, under the pressure, start saying things that weren't true. I would say as well that the people who, who haven't are the people who, um, to this day, some of them are treated very, very poorly at Guantanamo. They're the people who are regarded as the biggest troublemakers. And I think you could almost um, draw a connection between the people, some of the people who are still held in solitary, who are regarded as, um, as, as troublemakers, like Shaka Armour. Um, because part of it is that they refuse to, they refuse to break under that pressure. Um, but you know, those are the those are the evidentiary the evidentiary issues that I think are massively important. I think they I think I think the full story remains to be exposed. I think that hopefully we will reach a point where we're able to look back on this and 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 see see it for what it is a, um, an entire system. Much like the CIA's torture program, that was brutal, horrible, that it was of no purpose, um, or, or not of its intended purpose. You know, clearly part of this the intention was to terrorize, and it's done that. But, but in practical terms, for providing genuine information, um, for keeping America safe, for foiling plots, for um, dealing with any of these people with anything resembling justice, nothing. Nothing has ever happened. Nothing good has come out of this. Um, so, to conclude, um, we have, you know, I'm hoping that we have the prisoners approved for release who will be released. I'm hoping that, that we'll see these periodic review boards continue and that maybe we can find ways, if things look like they're slowing down, of trying to push these issues about the appalling um, failures in the supposed evidence. Um, and we will then be left, hopefully, with a much smaller number of prisoners at Guantanamo, at which point President Obama can try and find some way to move them to the U.S. mainland to enable him to actually close Guantanamo. Um, I don't quite know how, if we can reach that point, or if it would happen, or even if it did happen, um, how much of that would be good, how much wouldn't. I actually think that the people who are facing trials, they should abandon the military commissions and they should move those people to the federal prison system here to face trials in federal court. I'm not sure about the, about the hopefully ever smaller number of people that they still say are too difficult to release, but they have their evidentiary issues. You know, the war in Afghanistan is kind of officially over, folks, so pretty much everyone should be released. Um, there are going to be people that they're going to be umming and eyeing about, and I don't honestly know whether it would make more sense to bring them here. Part of me thinks, in fact, I've long thought that there are so many more rights not to be held without charge or trial in the U.S. <coughs> that, that successful challenges would be able to be mounted, but maybe not. Maybe that would play into the hands of some really terrible people who want that into right here. Maybe those people should remain at Guantanamo for those issues to be resolved. I don't know, but at least we're able to start having these conversations that look like maybe the last stages of Guantanamo. We certainly haven't been in that position for many, many years. Um, so I'll leave it at that. I want, I want, obviously, my fellow panelists to speak, and I want you all to have a chance to talk and ask questions and get a discussion going. So thank you very much.
was also released. And um, so but my client, Al Jazawi, who I wrote a lot about, many of you um, have listened to my stories about him over the years. And he was one of the first to be, I, I want to say one of the first and almost one of the last, to be released by Obama in 2010, once he had this committee that reviewed all the men. Um, Mr. Uh, Al Jazawi was released to the country of Georgia that was willing to take him on as a refugee. Uh, he was very grateful for that. My husband and I went and visited him in Georgia right when he was released. Um, it was an amazing experience and it was fun being there for that first week while he was kind of learning what it was like to be a free man. Uh, he had a lot of health problems. He has a lot of health problems, but he's uh, hanging in there. Mr. Al Jazawi uh, stayed in the country of Georgia for almost four years, um, three and a half, almost four years. And the country of Georgia was good to him. They were very patient and they, um, they dealt with his issues, I, I think, in a very fair way. Um, in 2014, early 2014, Mr. Al Jazawi went back to Libya. He went back there for a couple of reasons. That was his homeland. Um, Gaddafi was gone, which was one of the reasons he had left uh, Libya in the first place and had moved to Afghanistan and got married and had a child um, in Afghanistan. But now Gaddafi was gone, but also some health problems uh, that Mr. Al Jazawi wasn't comfortable with, um, the, the help that he was getting from the Georgians. He didn't think their health care was up to par. One of the things the Georgians adopted from our good uh, counsel to them was pre-existing conditions don't get treated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> of course, everything he yeah, was suffering from was a pre-existing condition. So, um, so he moved back to Libya, and he moved back to Libya, um, as I said, beginning of 2014. Uh, about six, no, it must be, I'm losing track of time, but sometime in the last couple of months, for the first time, his wife and child joined him in Libya which um, they had not seen each other for, well, his daughter was only a couple months old. She was now 13. And his uh, wife, of course, hadn't seen him in all those years. And so they joined him in, in Libya. I, I still talk with Mr. al and We get on Skype and connect with each other every once in a while to uh, figure out what's going on. And when I got the email, or first the uh, Skype message saying, can you call me? I was kind of busy and it took me a few days to call him and he said, I just want to tell you my wife and daughter are here. Um, so so that was, that's, that's the good news side. Um, the bad news side is my other client, Mr. Razak Ali. And I haven't written as much about him. Um, he's, he's just a nice guy. He's the one I wrote about. He loved the Harry Potter books. Um, you know, when I went to meet with him, we sat and talked about Harry Potter. Fortunately, I'd read all the books. So um, I was able to fill him in on things when the new editions hadn't quite been brought to Guantanamo and they were um, waiting for the next edition. Uh, he's, he's someone who's been considered compliant. Um, I don't think that that's meant in a, a bad way. He just doesn't but doesn't argue with anybody. He's just kind of a, a mellow guy. And the reason he's in Guantanamo is because he happened to have the misfortune of being in a guest house in Pakistan in 2002 where someone else was staying that the government thought was a bad guy. And I say thought was a bad guy. Uh, this is Abu Zubaida. A lot of times you hear that name and it's always uh, in the media, it's like, this is someone who's really bad. Unfortunately, after they waterboarded him about a hundred times, and I'm talking about Mr. Abu Zubaida, not my client, after they waterboarded him almost a hundred times, they realized he really wasn't who they thought he was. And he really um, was not connected with Al-Qaeda, and he was not connected with the Taliban, and uh, sorry, it was just a little mistake. But my client's mistake was being in the same guest house as him. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when you go to a bed and breakfast, you're going to check out, you know, who else is there and, and what their background is. And they had no connection with each other. My client was only there for less than two weeks, um, waiting to get his papers to go back to Algeria, his country, 
but that has put him on the list of people who should be forever detained. So when you hear that these are people who are too bad to be released, um, but there's no evidence to keep them, I want you to think about Mr. Razak Ali. Because no, there's no evidence. There's no evidence of anything except that he was in this house. But to keep up the facade of the terrorists, you know, and who these people are, um, he has to stay. And I'll tell you just a little bit about the, the process I've gone through with Mr. Razak um, Mr. Razak Ali's case to just let you know how frustrating, stupid, infuriating, whatever other adjectives I can come up with, I, I would probably throw in in the course of this. But we had a habeas hearing. Um, this was back in, again, I'm losing track of time. I believe it was around 2009, um, maybe 2010. It was in front of a judge who was appointed by George Bush Jr., who um, was not very helpful, not very um, friendly. And uh, he determined pretty quickly on, uh, within an hour, I would say, of the habeas hearing, isn't it enough counsel that he was in that house? And I explained that no, <laughs> that's not enough. And, and also there's no evidence of anything was going on in that house other than there was a person there who was arrested that we thought was a bad guy. We had a four-day hearing. And we call it a hearing, but my client wasn't allowed to be there. My client uh, was allowed to listen to my unclassified opening statement um, from Guantanamo by telephone with a translator that I had to pay for at the courthouse. And ironically, because of the mal-equipment that seems to be a constant problem uh, with Guantanamo, despite all the money they get for running this base, um, after 20 minutes of my after 20 minutes, some of which time was uh, spent trying to get the equipment working by the court, uh, he was cut off. We didn't know that. I, I, I assumed, <laughs> you know what they say, I assumed that he was listening the whole time to the opening. Um, he wasn't, he didn't, he got to hear a very small part of it. And then he was cut off. And that was only the unclassified opening, which was an hour of the four day proceeding. So he doesn't know, and I'm not allowed to talk with him about any of the evidence they had. He's not allowed to know why he was even accused of being a bad guy. I can ask him questions to get at my defense of him, but I can't tell him what the government has told me. And so I, I say this because there's a couple weird aspects to this, and one is that there was only one witness, and I won't give you all the details, there was only one so-called witness who had anything to say about my client. And this was a man um, whose name was Muhammad Noor. I might have his name backwards, um, but I'm sorry. Uh, but whose name, uh, but who said within a day or two of arriving at Guantanamo, he looked at the, the photo book the family photos, and said, oh, the pers this person here, he used this nickname, and he used the nickname for my client, or not for my client, and he said, he was in the house with me. Well, this man was in the same guest house, and this man did go through the military commission and was charged with being in the military commission. And he was charged with um, crimes that were not crimes when he was charged. And he pled guilty. And so, in, in, and he got a plea, and the plea was that he would get out in three years, and he's out. And as part of the, the plea, he had to admit that everything he had said previously was true. They didn't go through and say, is this true, is this true, is this true? They said, everything you said before is true, right? And he said, yes. And so my judge said, you know what? He just took a plea, he admitted everything he said was true, and he said that your client used this nickname, and he looked at his photo and said he was in the same house as him. 
And so therefore that's, that's the end of the game. The other ironic thing was it wasn't my client's photo. Oh. <laughs> and when I was arguing to the judge, and they put the photo up, and I, I had seen the photo a few days earlier for the first time, and I said to the judge, that's not my client. And the judge said, but the government's saying it's your client. <laughs> and I said, but it's not. It doesn't look like him. I've met him. No one in that room, no one in that courtroom had ever seen my client. But if they had, if I could have gone and just taken a photo myself, they would see that that photo was not my client. We lost the habeas hearing. Uh, we lost the appeal. And just recently, I filed a cert petition in the uh, Supreme Court, and we lost the cert petition. No one cares. The judges don't care. If the government says this is the way it is, that's, that's all that matters. So now I'm at that stage where I have to look for this review panel for my client. Um, one of my uh, fellow Guantanamo attorneys uh, just d decided to rename the list of people who are uh, not cleared for release as the list of people who are waiting to be cleared. And I like that definition. It made me smile, at least for a few minutes yesterday. Um, so my client is waiting to be released. But part of the waiting process is just being told you can even present your case to be released. And as Andy just said, there's only been nine or 10 men since Obama set this regulation saying they can try to you know, prove themselves worthy of release. Um, they didn't do anything for a year and a half, and now they've had like nine or ten of these hearings. Um, and you know, it's it's go gone pretty well for the nine or ten, at least five or six of them. But you can't just say, "Hey, we're ready to get put on that list." You have to wait for them to tell you uh, they want to hear your case next. Um, the person that that said that was my client and um, who took that plea deal. Other good news, um, earlier this week, uh, yes, earlier this week, and, it, and it's one of those magical moments that you don't know exactly how it happened or why it happened. It's just a newspaper really, or a news release from the Pentagon. But they determined, the Pentagon determined that Mr. Noor um, was wrongly convicted and they erased, they um, took away his plea deal and said he's, he's free. I mean, he's free, but now there's no conviction against him. And that's because it wasn't a crime what he was charged with when he was charged with it. So now I've got this extra little layer that I have to figure out what to do with, and that's that what he admitted to can't have any weight to it since it was all admitted in a false proceeding. <laughs> yes, so that's, that's my life. One other, one other thing I want to just add, and that's uh, and he said you should read WikiLeaks because it's like a, you know, it shows you just how messed up the picture is. Now things don't make sense. I can't read WikiLeaks. Right. I, can't. Uh, I cannot read WikiLeaks because it's classified. And even though it was released to the public, I have a security clearance. And if I read the WikiLeaks, then I'm violating security protocols. Mm. So, someone reads it out loud to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> With that, I will turn the microphone to the I always learn so much that I couldn't make up. It's too bizarre to make up. Um, and I, all, I get to meet all these amazing people who we were protesting with, um, Marie and Sunday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday in Washington on the anniversary, and all of you who are contributing you're thinking on how we're going to shut this down tonight, and we do want to get to that. 
Um, and then I've gotten to travel with Andy for, um, we think, five or six years now during January around the country. And just, just to say a word about Andy, he was also telling me on this visit that when he wrote his book, Guantanamo Files, he thought, well, maybe he'd better, maybe it wasn't that worth doing the book because so many people would be writing such books. You know, well, guess what? Nobody has ever gone into the detail that Andy Worthington has to tell the stories of the prisoners and to have us get at least a little bit of an idea of what their actual lives have been. So uh, I'm very glad to be here with you two in particular on this tour. Um, I just wanted to step back big picture very briefly and um, raise the point that I think sometimes get lost, gets lost when we're focusing on Guantanamo, or even when we're focusing on the, the Senate's torture report, which after all is narrowly focused itself only on the CIA and is only a part of the report anyway, and then is highly redacted. There's a lot more of the story here in terms of indefinite detention, torture, extraordinary rendition, the creation of black sites all around the world, which we're only, we only know part of, let's be honest, right? And Abu Ghraib and story after story of what the US has done in the so-called global war on terror and when I was speaking in Washington this weekend, and we had so many authorities on Guantanamo, I was thinking, well, I'm not a specialist on Guantanamo, but I am kind of a specialist on exposing the U.S. war on terror and this illegitimate, immoral, unjust enterprise the U.S. has been involved in, particularly since 2001. And just to draw something out very broadly, Andy got here last week and reminded us that 2015, it's the 800th anniversary of the Magna Carta. So we were in a high school class a week ago in, in New York, and um, Andy was telling them about the Magna Carta and what it means, explaining, I thought, in very real terms that the Magna Carta means that a government cannot arbitrarily lock you up, not charge you and, and give you no way to leave. But yet, this is exactly what the U.S. has done. And I felt, you know, it seemed maybe the students were not really getting this in the full dimension. And I, it's also been our experience since we've been marching around the streets for um, 12 years now wearing orange jumpsuits that a lot of young people, especially black and Latino young men, will look at those jumpsuits and say, you know, that's us. That's what they put us in. Sometimes it comes out as, why aren't you worried about us the way you're worried about those men in Guantanamo? And sometimes it comes out in a way of a shock of recognition that there are people being mass incarcerated <coughs> and tortured and abused all around the world by this government. Not, not just the states and the local authorities, but the, the federal government of the United States, which is waging this illegitimate war around the world. So, you know, I raised this to the students um, at the high school, and I said, look, just think about it. If you, you get locked up for some petty thing on the streets, you're stopped and frisked, you get locked up for possession and whatever it is, but there's really literally <coughs> no way for you to get out. You're locked up forever. And this is what the men in Guantanamo are going through, many of which were clearly not involved in any criminal wrongdoing against the United States. The vast majority of have actually already been released because of that. And this is a part of the story that people in this country, I honestly think and know, do not get. If the government has called these people the worst of the worst and said that they're bad criminals, then okay, put blinders on, hope that they're doing everything to keep us safe. But they're not. Clearly they're not. Clearly we know all that. Um, this is 
something that's completely unacceptable. And you can't say that you are the ruling democracy in history. You know, the most advanced country in the history of the world, this great experiment in democracy and all of these things they say, and be spectacularly violating the 800-year-old habeas corpus. And you can't be constantly doing this on the basis of lies. The other thing that you can't be doing is the occupations that the U.S. has done in Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, the drone wars in Pakistan, in Yemen, in Somalia, in, Lib in Libya, all of these you know, so-called humanitarian interventions are not without indefinite detention, without locking people for no good reason. And when I'm saying draw the lens back a little bit, I'm really calling into question the legitimacy of the whole enterprise. Uh, this is very challenging in the world today, and we hear all the time, world can't wait, but you know, we've been struggling over this. There really is no anti-war movement at the level that is needed these days because people tell us, well, don't we have to do something about ISIS? Don't we need to be bombing Iraq and Syria? Well, first of all, who's the we? We didn't sign up for any of this. You know, but leaving that aside, our government is now, uh, and there was a Pentagon release within the last week admitting that there may have been significant civilian casualties in um, a missile strike, whether it was drone or cruise missile, missile I'm not sure, um, but in Syria, caused by the U.S. We know that, we all know, up to two million people, if you work back to 1991, the U.S. occupation of Iraq have been killed. We know 4.5 million displaced. We've read, many of us, I mean, who's read uh, Dirty Wars by Jeremy Scahill? Okay, you remember, and I'll tell the story very briefly, just so we can keep this picture, Camp Nama, nasty ass military area. This is the US military's name for a secret camp that was run by special forces in Iraq somewhere around 2005 when General David Petraeus was cooking up the ideas for the surge. This is a place where the officers did not use their real names, even to each other. This is a place where there were no rules on detention. There were no rules for the treatment of prisoners, where prisoners died by being frozen, by being abused, tortured, and mistreated. None of that is in this frigging torture report. This is still, you know, in the possession of a very strong, significant branch of the U.S. military. And it's, but it is all of a picture. Why is Guantanamo so important? I would go back to what this represents around the world as, a, as an abrogation of the legal treaties that the United States has signed, of the myth that is created about freedom and democracy, and uh, respecting the rule of law, which we know it has not done. Um, and it still remains hugely important that the 122 men still detained there um, get justice. And, you know, I have a little difference of opinion with Andy, and we've, you know, been talking about this. World Can't Wait and, and other organizations have come to the aid of many, many Muslim men who have been convicted in federal courts over the last 12 years. Many, many of those, and we've looked into these cases, have been set up and framed by the FBI under the, you know, the domestic anti-torture laws. Very draconian trials, not really allowed to defend themselves if they went to trial. The conviction rate is something in the high 90s percents in all of these cases, so I have no basis to assume that 
just coming into a federal court, and this has been Candace's experience, I would say on these habeas in, in the first district, um, there is no assumption that in a court one is going to find justice. And to bring it back to the first example I used of the youth that we run into on the street, um, there is an assumption of constitutional rights and the protection of law and the ability to know the charges and defend yourself. But as we are all acutely aware of right now, first, you have to survive your encounter with law enforcement. Mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter is not a policy of any level of government in this country. There are gross violations. Hundreds of people have been killed by the police. And then there's the court system. And we know that in New York City, for instance, something like 95% of all cases are pled out. Mm -hmm. People don't get trials mm -hmm. to prove their innocence. You know, we had to fight like hell to get Gregory a trial to prove his innocence. You know, and then still justice was not done in the case of, you know, patent political repression. So I don't want to put a lot of faith in the court system. Where I want to put faith, and this is again, why it's so important that all of us are here, is in the standing up for justice and the exposure and the fighting for justice that we are all doing together. And rather than saying at this point, well, lots of people are involved in the Black Lives Matter protest, um, it's, it's taking away from this issue. Absolutely not. We have, we have had in the last six months, five months, the biggest mass upsurge in the streets since I was um, out on the streets in the 60s along with some of you. It's wonderful and I think the challenge for us is to internationalize this and really help people understand that yes, the destruction in Gaza, what's going on in Guantanamo, what's going on in Ferguson and Staten Island, and what's gone on um, in the black sites around the world by the U.S. is all of a piece. These are all our brothers, our sisters and brothers, you know, whether they're here or around the world. Um, so the, the last thing I would just like to say, and uh, before we open this up for um, a little serious conversation, and, and again, everybody is welcome. There are, there are no questions that are too simple. There are no questions that are unwelcome whether you've been involved in this movement for years or you've just come to learn, please, um, and, and comments are not ruled out either. You don't have to have a question. If you have some thinking, please bring it out. Um, Andy Worthington, as I mentioned, is um, the preeminent journalist working on the whole picture of Guantanamo. We heard from another Guantanamo lawyer last night in Massachusetts, which was really kind of cool, that in the secure area where the Guantanamo attorneys can only look at the prepare their cases because, you know, Candace can't walk around with her notes. Everything's classified. There are three copies of Andy's book, Guantanamo Files, and that they're well-thumbed. And it's that book that the attorneys go to when they're trying to you remember who did, who said what, what was the story on this prison or how does it fit together. And Andy has taken out um, 10 days of his busy writing and research schedule to come to the U.S., the scene of the crime, you know, if you will, to talk with us. And I'd, I'd really like to pass the hat to support his work. You can also certainly donate to him online on his website, andyworthington.co.uk. But if you'd like to write a check to World Can't Wait or um, give cash. We are converting it all via the wonder of PayPal and getting it to Andy. Um, so with that, I think should we go to discussion? Thank you. I just, I just, yeah. you got
This one works. Okay. This one. Yeah, this works. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, thank you to all our wonderful uh, speakers. Uh, can we have a round of applause? Like I said earlier, we, we want this to be more of a conversation and a dialogue. And as Deborah said, there you know there's no uh, question that is or comment that is unacceptable. And um, so please questions, comments from the audience. First of all, thanks for the panelists here. It's really good talk and. Uh, yeah, that's for discussion. I just want to make a comment. Forty years ago, by this time of the year, I was in a concentration camp in Chile, where I was detained arbitrarily because I was at that time a communist, all the terrorists of today. And as a communist, the while we were confined to those concentration camps, we never went into a trial. Never. We were never charged. We were just, according to the government, the dictatorship at that time, were dangerous for the interior security of the state. No habeas corpus possible. The family didn't know at the beginning where we were because we were clandestine concentration camps and tolerance centers. We had to understand that at that time also we were officers graduating the School of the Americas who was in Panama, treating us there. So 40 years ago, the experience suffered by people in Guantanamo, by the judicial system in this country, it's about the same. And I just wanted to mention that so we can think about that this is not a new thing here in the United States. It has been practiced in many other countries around the world, especially in Latin America and by the 70s when we had over just dictatorship uh, military governments all over. They were all practicing about the same thing. The judicial system was about the same behavior. So it's important to mention this, to remind us that it's not a new thing here in the United States. But it was practiced there, and it was trained people here in the US to go and practice that torturing. I was suffering isolation confinement, but we have a big discussion today, even if it is torture or not waterboarding, all the techniques that we had seen in Guantanamo were practiced at that time, which they were bringing from Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And this is the case of John Birch here in, the, in Chicago, where he learned everything there in Vietnam and then practiced it here with people that are still detained. So I just wanted to make that comment and thanks the panelists for bringing up all these points that are, it made me really fly back 40 years ago when I was there under those conditions and I'm lucky I am surviving. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the panelists, and thank you to the organizers of tonight's event. I have three questions, so please bear with me. Uh, for Candace and Andy, I wanted to know currently, what are the legislative barriers in Congress? And secondly, who exactly should we be applying pressure to the President or Congress, specifically the U.S. Committee on Armed Services and its counterpart in the Senate? And then for uh, Deborah, given your deep experience in protesting and standing up for justice, what has been most effective with respect to advocacy and what is this movement lacking? Do you need resources? Do you need people? Or do you need more coalition partners? stories out there about what the hurdles are. The president says Congress won't let him do it. Um, 
because of the, uh, I'm, to, I'm trying to remember the name of the law that was passed, but it's in, in the budget, Congress has put um, certain prohibitions on the transfer of the NDAA. In the NDAA. NDAA, thank you. Um, but the president has been able to do it anyway, and he could have done it all these years anyway. So that's why I say it's um, what people are saying and what's really the actual, the actual actuality is two different things. Pressure should be put on the president. Congress has already said they don't want to have anything to do with it. Now we've got a Republican Congress. It's going to be even more difficult. Nothing will get passed to make it more helpful. But the president has the power to make to move these men without Congress, and that's what's been going on over the last year, despite Congress. So that's where I would put the pressure. If I may, Andy, you mentioned you know the trials taking place on the mainland, and I've read in the press that there's a transfer ban. Is that actual? Uh, do we need to fight for that in Congress? I mean, what? Just as an example. Yeah, I mean, the, the problem is that, um, uh, I mean, just very quickly, the specific, the specific obstacle to the release of prisoners is that the Secretary of Defense has to certify to Congress that steps have been taken to mitigate any risk that a released prisoner um, you know, could pose. Um, and they have to provide 30 days notice before they release any prisoner to Congress. Uh, the ban on bringing prisoners to the U.S. mainland for any reason is one that has been upheld by Congress year after year after year. And, and in the year when we had legislative progress because of the hunger strike and President Obama's relatively robust response to that, finally, um, at the end of that year, which is when the NDAA negotiations take place, um, with a lot of pressure from all kinds of Democrats, with a lot of pressure from Senator Carl Levin at the time, um, the restrictions on the release of prisoners were, were eased slightly, which, made it, which has made it easier to release prisoners but um, Congress absolutely refused to drop the ban on bringing prisoners to the U.S. mainland for any reason. With the control of Congress by the Republicans now, that's clearly not going to happen. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked with a senior lawyer who was hoping that John McCain might be having a good day. John McCain's having a very bad day at the moment. He could change his mind, you know. Um, the man is crazy, so he, you know, he opposes torture, but sometimes he's pro Guantanamo and sometimes he's against it, and he's very pro it just at the moment. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I would suggest on, the, on, on that point it's not looking great, and that the pressure we would need to put on President Obama is that um, he needs to do something through an executive order before he leaves office if he means it. Um, that would be, you know, for, for moving prisoners to the US mainland. But as I, was, as I was mentioning, you know, there are discussions that we all need to have about if we get to that point, what is the best thing to do with the prisoners? Um, I do think that the military commissions uh, will drag on forever at Guantanamo and that there, there will be no trials. Um, so, you know, we could have a situation where some men will stay in Guantanamo forever, or we could try and work towards a point where we say one way or another, they should be moved here so that that facility can be closed and we can begin to, to take apart the last bit of the story with the people who need to be tried and with um, finding a, a legally acceptable way of releasing prisoners whilst they're on the US mainland. But, you know, we need to talk about those things. I can't, I can't say what's the best way forward. Um, and all I can hope at the moment is that we keep on getting the prisoners approved for a release released so that we reach that point where um, the authorities to some extent will be saying, you know, the Republicans will now say, okay, okay, you keep releasing people and we don't want you to re release them, but now you're down to the ones that all of us believe are the bad guys. And it's not, it's still too many. There have never been a really small, small number of bad guys, allegedly. Um, so I hope we just keep this conversation going because I think we can all be pretty sure that we're not gonna hear it in most parts of the media. And that what we will hear um, is a, a, a bunch of the usual hysterical nonsense from the people who sadly are your elected representatives. So to confirm, we should uh, apply pressure exclusively on the president and ignore the noise from Congress. I mean, would that be your advice? Or at this point? Probably. I mean, I think if you have Congress people that, um, that you think might be reasonable, then it's, then it's worthwhile engaging with them. But um, if not, then...
and it's not. Okay. <laughs> well, just to give an can, is this on? Yes. Uh, to give an example, after the releases last night, the Times reported today. It was a terrible article in the Times. Here's the Times saying, you know, a couple weeks ago, prosecute Cheney and Bush and close Guantanamo and torture is bad. Then they come out with the reporter Helene Cooper today saying about the release of the four men who were sent to Oman, right next door to Yemen, that the government, as I'm paraphrasing broadly, but the government has given no assurance that these men will not return to the battlefield. Oh, what? Four. They were never Four. on the battlefield. This is why they were released. But this is feeding into a whole, at the, you know, this is the most prestigious newspaper in the so-called free world. The New York Times, you know, spreading around this idea that these men have been released to return to the battlefield. And I, to answer, to, I, I, we should all talk about your question of what would it take. What does this movement need? Well, we need a much bigger section of the people in this country saying, no, this is completely unacceptable. We're not going along with it. We don't care what politician justifies it, what court justifies it. It's wrong, and we won't settle for it. We need young people in particular who were very small when Guantanamo was open to know this story. We need cultural expressions. We need big protests. We need films. Um, there, there's a lot of things we need, and yes, more coalition partners in the sense of, um, you know, where the hell are the churches? We go every year to stand in front of the White House, and I have to say, other than the Catholic workers, there's never anybody from the Catholic clergy or for the Pope or the Pope calling for the cause of Guantanamo. There are a few liberal Protestant groupings, and there's always a, a liberal rabbi, and, and there occasionally there are imams. And this year, for the first time, we had an organized presence of Muslims to close Guantanamo, which was small but very good. But where the hell are the churches? Where's academia? Where are the people who have a cultural voice in the society to continually speak up and to say, I don't care if there's only 122 men left. This place has to be closed. And this is a, it is, and yes, money. Money would be very good. We need to work on all this together. And mostly what we need is people. And we need people who are willing to speak up, get in the streets together, join in the protests around Black Lives Matter, perhaps wearing orange jumpsuits and bringing signs about Guantanamo and uniting with this. I can think of a lot of things, but I know that this is a group process. I thank you for the question. I'd just like to say, if I could, that Deborah and I talked about this rather poor New York Times article today. And sometimes I write articles where I take apart badly written articles, because they happen all the time. They're, they're formulaic expressions. It's almost a formulaic expression. That one in the article today about the United States not providing the, what kind of assurances are provided that these men will not return to the battlefield. So it's helpful if people read these things, and, and if you see these lazy or distorted um, pieces of journalism, to, to, to try and complain about it. I think it would be interesting if we could start to get letters published about it. And, you know, and it isn't just here. Um, when a Kuwaiti man was released from Guantanamo about three months ago, um, the BBC News website reported terror suspect released from Guantanamo to Kuwait. Mm -hmm. Now, I know I have a good friend at the BBC News website, so I fired a quick email to him, you know, saying, Steve, uh, just saw this. Um, you do know that this man was never accused of a terrorism. This is a Kuwaiti man whose, um, whose sole crime seems to have been that he undertook a bit of rifle training at a training camp in Pakistan one afternoon um, and spent you know, 13 years of his life in Guantanamo. There is no allegation that he was ever accused of terrorism. And, and my mate Steve went, you're dead right, Andy, I'll change it. He changed the headline. Um, so complaints are maybe a good part of the way in which we can try and get to get these things discussed as they should be, because there's a constant 
spin, lies, distortion that we're being fed all the time. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's very noticeable. Now, at the moment, it's a tsunami because of what happened in Paris. But it's always here. It's always there in the, in the, in the US media. So I think challenging that would be a good idea. Could we just talk about Shocker for a minute? Yeah. Yeah. So you saw the little video earlier. Um, it would be great if people want to stand with this at the end of the evening. Um, we're putting the photos up on the We Stand with Shaka website. And I, I didn't really talk much about it, but I don't want to take that much time. Shaka Ahmad has, is a very intelligent man, very eloquent, very principled. He's fought for the rights of the prisoners ever since they arrived at Guantanamo. And as a result, he has been subjected to torture and other abuse. Um, he has certainly knows about, may have witnessed the torture and abuse of other prisoners. And we think that the only reason he's not been released is he's approved for release, and he's a Brit legal British resident, is that neither the US nor the UK really wants him back because he will talk, and when he talks, he will embarrass them. Now, we all know our leaders are very good at not being held accountable in courtrooms or anything they did. So it doesn't seem that anything that he could say could lead to prosecutions, and you know, this, frankly, is full of some terrible information. I doubt that you come up with worse. So it's embarrassment alone, it seems to be, that's keeping him in there. And it's part of the sign of the injustice of Guantanamo, that if, if you threaten to embarrass them by what you know and what you say, they'll shut you to the back of a pretty long queue where everybody's moving quite slowly anyway. That's why you shouldn't have unjust systems of detaining people, because it makes it, everything is political about getting out of Guantanamo, rather than anything to do with justice. So if you could support the campaign and you do want to do, that would be wonderful. Um, you know, Shaka Armour is initially a Saudi citizen, so um, you know we, we do think that, that on both sides of the Atlantic there have been wishes to send him back there, where he wouldn't be able to talk freely. Um, but the reason that we're really mounting a campaign in the UK at the moment is that he is the only person in Guantanamo where we can put pressure particularly on our Prime Minister in the UK, David Cameron, who keeps saying, yeah, we asked for him, but ultimately it's up to the Americans. It's like, it's not up to the Americans, Mr. Cameron. You have obligations to this man to get him back to the UK to, to his wife and family. So that's why we're pushing in, in his particular case. And if you want to support it, that would be great. Thanks. Yeah. Couple so, I want to thank all of the panelists. This will be tremendous. And I have questions for all of you, but I will just piggyback on to one of the last things that was said when Deborah said, where are the churches? And I think that, that you're pointing to something that is really uh, uh, something that we fail to do, which is for the churches in this country to address the incredible antagonism towards Muslim people that's being used by the government. In the last year, uh, I'd say this book, The New Jim Crow, helped us see that it's systemic racism. And I, I wonder if you could react to the suggestion that this is also a systemic racism problem and that for us to truly succeed against it, we're going to have to apply ourselves to that problem. Well, you know, absolutely. I guess it was part of the point I was trying to bring out about the connections. Our government is mass incarcerating, you know, it's 2.3 or 2.4 million people in this country. 25% of all the prisoners on the globe are in this country and 6% of the population. Um, and no country to date that I'm aware of has had the wherewithal to imprison people possibly in 20 different countries to set up black sites around the world. And I, and I really agree, of course, that it's systemic racism. And it is, as Jim Crow uh, rested on, it's based on fear. And it's, a, it, it's the creation of fear um, among people in this country that you, know, you could be a victim of terrorism at any moment. Well, as um, somebody memorably said, I don't know if it was Russell Brand, he said, you know, more people die slipping in their bathtub in this country than die of terrorism incidents. So it is all out of proportion to what 
the real situation is, but it has a very powerful ideological effect on people living here. It is certainly white supremacy and it is certainly um, a smugness that the West is the most advanced society that could ever have existed. And we have to work on all of that. Uh, I, I would just say very briefly, you know, just as another version of what I said earlier about analogies between Paris and Guantanamo that simply aren't there, not just because these men have been held for 13 years away from absolutely everything, but because the only thing that, that, that you could make as a connection is that both groups of people are Muslims. So it is deeply, profoundly racist to suggest that there could be any connection, because the next thing that comes is the kind of thing that comes out of the mouths of racists in the UK, and I'm sure it's not dissimilar here, you know, because we know Islam is a very wicked religion. That kind of unacceptable racist stuff. So Guantanamo obviously is a prison for Muslims. If you, if you change the denomination of the people there, and it was Christians, or it was Jewish people, how would the response be? Um, and to my knowledge, you know, Everyone who was held at Guantanamo was a Muslim, except perhaps there was an Iranian well digger who was held there in the early days, who had crossed into Afghanistan, I think in search of hashish, <laughs> and had been captured and sent to Guantanamo, and he said he was a Catholic. And all the other prisoners have been Muslim. Just to make one tiny point about the war on terror, the US um, enterprise to dominate the Middle East is not the result of Islamophobia. It is not the result of hatred of Muslims. For the most part, the, the reaction to 9-11 may have been somewhat vengeance on the part of the Bush regime, but actually the opposite. The fact that they're pursuing this illegitimate war of occupation and domination in the Middle East for global strategic reasons has proved um, conveniently supported by the creation of fear of Muslims in this country. Well, you just uh, made a little bit the point that I was going to try to make now, because I agree, of course, it is racism, but I think the main issue here is not racism. The main here is economics, and it makes me think, you know, of a Facebook joke that I saw today, like saying, uh, killing people for religion is not civilized. What is civilized is killing them for economy. And uh, it's true. I mean, you know, uh, we cannot forget that all of these racism, all of these mass racism whose last expression is the Charlie Hebdo, which I don't believe at all that this hasn't, hasn't even done, hasn't even been done by any Islamic but it's a kind of extreme right to give even more power to the extreme right in France, create hysteria and create a kind of patriarch act in Europe. Uh, that's what I think. But I think that we, it's very, very important that we don't forget that the reason, the real reason for this is the, the arms business of the United States, is the opium in Afghanistan, is the oil in the Middle East, and it is the geographical thing, and that all the other things are just subservient to this, just as in Chile, what was important was to keep the same families and the same companies in power and to make sure that the interests of the United States were protected. And then, you know, all of this is always the reason, and I think we cannot forget that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions or, or comments from our audience? Please excuse me for hogging the mic, but my next question is with respect to next steps. Um, you know, you mentioned that we need to get uh, more churches. You know, my, I'm looking around and I'm thinking, you know, where are the the masajid, the mosques? And you know we're late to the game. Really, we just really organized this year, as you stated. Uh, and, and and secondly, I wanted to know, um, you know, with respect to resources, you know, is there a legal fund or is there you know a media strategy that's outlined that we could support? Uh, I've worked on political campaigns. We've put up TV ads and op-eds, and you know.
a very sophisticated uh, media strategy. I think that's uh, to get the, the large masses to wake up or you know, to rally behind this issue. Uh, could you speak about the media issue and then also about funding? You know, you have your campaign for Shacker and then your, your independent general campaign. Where are the funds where that we could donate to and uh, raise uh, money for? It's my understanding that, and I know this personally, that many of the men at Guantanamo have been represented by private attorneys or have been organized. Um, and people have given up large sections of their lives for the last 13 years to do this once. Well, it took three years for them to get any habeas rights and be represented by anyone. So maybe it's 10 years, but it's a long chunk of time. And then even some of the best representation has, oddly enough, come from people in the U.S. military who were really angered uh, about the treatment of the prisoners. So it isn't so much um, funds for legal representation, although I, I may stand corrected, and, and if anyone can enlighten me, that would be good. Um, the Council on American-Islamic Relations is part of the coalition to close Guantanamo, for instance. There has been thinking and efforts to reach the Muslim community. I guess we've always felt like the Muslim community did not set up Guantanamo, you know? <laughs> they suffered disproportionately from it, but it, but it is, you know, the ruling power structure of the U.S. that set it up. And that's, um, we really have to direct our thinking there, and it is, um, the great majority of people living in the U.S. of all nationalities that has to take action on it. Um, if you let's talk. If you have ideas for media strategy and ways to reach people right now on social media, which would be very important to counter some of the things that Andy is talking about. Um, there's a lot of shit on social media right now in relation to. Um, what's happened in, in the last week or so. Um, but there's, there can be a whole different message. And again, if putting out the message of humanity and the planet come first, which is you know, a particular message World Can't Wait is developed, but it comes out in a lot of different ways. You know, witness against torture, um, people singing, bringing out the stories of the individual prisoners, I feel is so important. And I just want to mention that Joe Hickman was on Democracy Now! this morning, who's a former guard at Guantanamo. His new book comes out Tuesday called Murder at Camp Delta, and it is his um, eyewitness account of being at Guantanamo on the night that three men died. It reportedly, you know, the U.S. military said it was simultaneous suicide. and. Um, most of us never thought that that could possibly be the case, but here comes another book. There's a book by um, Murat Kanaz over here. We have a couple copies of. Um, these are small things, but again, I think the more people know and have the ability to, you know, read Candace's blog, read Andy's blog, read people that are writing about Guantanamo and find ways to share it. That. Um, that may reach people like, um, who was it that signed the Guantanamo ad that we put in the New York Times a year and a half ago? It was a comedian from The Daily Show. And we reached, yeah, I see. We reached him through social media, so never discount the importance of that. So. I just want to mention the, um, who's behind most of the legal strategy. And that's the Center for Constitutional Rights. And they have been important. They're the umbrella group for all of us that have volunteered our services. And if anyone wants to donate to, um, to the legal effort, that's who I would recommend donating to. Thank you. Um, well, I'd certainly be happy for us to carry on talking about possibilities. Um, the, the, I'd just like to mention again what, what Deborah was mentioning and what we've been talking about because it suddenly seems a big thing to me today, is that, you know, I, I've written for FAIR a few times, which is a magazine that um, addresses distortions in the media, and there's a few other 
things out there, but I don't think there's enough. I think we're lied to and spun to and, and given distorted stories so much that maybe we should think about trying to get um, some kind of grouping of people together who would be prepared to take these things on um, whenever they appear and, and address these distortions. That, that was just a thought. Anyway. I, I just wanted to speak to this on? Yeah. Um, just a couple of the comments that I thought were really important. Mario's about going back to Chile 40 years ago, um, and and yours about the economy at the root of it. When Andy was interviewed today on um, a Worldview, the the preceding uh, person was a historian of Cuba, and how did it come about that the U.S. even has control of Guantanamo? Because when the Cuban people were trying to fight for their liberation, the U.S. moved in and took over for Spain. And I think that um, that's, those are examples going back of that it's a real system of imperialism behind this that tortures human beings, that depends on the most vicious exploitation, and, and it's destroying the, the very planet that we depend upon. And I think most importantly, it's completely out of date, completely outmoded, completely unnecessary. And I would just add to that reading list, I hope people come and look at Revolution newspaper because it really is a way out of this. And I think if we start to connect the dots and really pull the lens back and see what kind of a system it is behind this, and that we take on the project of actually ridding the planet of this um, destructive menace. So I would invite you to come to that as well. Um, one, there was one more question right here in the front. Thanks again for the panel and everything. I just wanted to make a comment. When you talked about the bad journalism out there, and you had said something earlier, Deborah, but um, when you're on social media and stuff like that, like I've tried really hard to separate out, talk about the American empire, the deep state, and never say we. These people do not represent me in any way, shape, or form. Never say we. And if you can do that and get that the mind of the public, then it's not its not like you know, you've know got this cognitive dissonance going on. It's like you understand that there's an enemy within, you know, that there is an American empire, there is a ruling class, and there is a deep state, and our elected representatives don't have much to do uh, with that. And I just think it's an important way to talk, talk to people. Yes. is um, regarding black site prisons how ultimately who knows about them gives the money for them authorizes them approves them does it go up does the is the president of the United States is he involved with knowing about them um, and are they are they still around after in the Obama administration that makes sense? Um, as far as we know, they don't exist anymore. But having said that, I think if you read Jeremy Skyler, you'll see that out in, say, the Horn of Africa, there appear to be troubling um, facilities uh, that may well involve JSOC, which um, was a very shadowy organization that has come out of the shadows over recent years, partly through being exposed by people like Jeremy. Um, there are parts of the world where we don't really know what's happening. I think what we, what we know clearly in many places, and this is um, unacceptable in other ways, is that people are being taken out in drone attacks rather than being apprehended at all. Um, I also think that there, um, that there are kind of forward operating bases where the military holds people of interest for, um, generally I would say for a short amount of time rather than there being any long-term prison system, but where they are torturing people because there is um, Appendix M of the Army Field Manual contains a whole bunch of torture techniques which can be used at the discretion of the commanding officer. Um, if you want to go away and look at that, Jeffrey Kay, who's an, a psychologist in California who works on torture issues, um, has written very eloquently about that over the years. Those, I think, are the, are the kind of main issues. I think 
I think the biggest problem for um, for the torture issue is that it's been replaced with assassination. <laughs> um, and you know, and the biggest problem when we think of torture in itself is that we must continue to seek accountability for the you know the, the huge amount of crimes that we know have taken place, you know, took place during the Bush administration. Um, and that's really an issue I think of um, if you have laws and statutes prohibiting torture, which we do have, and if people are not prosecuted for breaking them, then we don't really have any of those laws and treaties. None of it really exists. And that's the situation that we're in. Whatever the United States might claim about the repugnance of torture and how, um, how you know, it, it, we have statutes against it, we signed up to conventions, no one's been prosecuted. So we have to continue to call for people to be held accountable. Um, and, you know, and as we're having these discussions in months to come, we need to try and address the different ways in which we can keep these stories alive. Because you know, clearly going after Dick Cheney is not that easy. Although invading his house and getting on his lawn is a good, good thing to do. Um, but none of it, we can't do a citizen's arrest on Dick Cheney and haul him to a court. My feeling is that the, the, the psychologist may be perhaps the most vulnerable um, of the people that come out in this. Um, I'm thinking of Mitchell and Jesson, the two military psychologists who reverse engineered the SEER program. Um, it was always terrible what we did. This report makes it even worse. They were sadistic. They didn't even know what they were doing. Um, all of it was useless. And they were paid $81 million. Uh, there is nothing good about this story. But <clears throat> clearly, they absolutely betrayed their principles. And I know that professional bodies have refused to get involved. But I think that keeping the pressure on, I would hope, maybe, maybe that's the route. But I think we should keep all the avenues open. Because I think it's important for all of us to, to understand that something that is wrong can't be brushed under the carpet because then it carries on being wrong and all our judgments against it are meaningless. So I hope we can keep on with that. One thing just about who we knew about these yeah. black sites, there was an interesting article in the paper this week about the fact that the, the salt pit, salt pit was a very notorious black site um, torture chamber in Afghanistan. And it turns out that that was approved by the Bureau of Prisons, the U.S. Bureau of Prisons. Wow. Wow. So, wow. you know, the knowledge is, it's not just a few bad apples somewhere, it goes up pretty high and it goes, you know, throughout our administration and our government. Well, uh, Betsy actually asked a question I was going to ask about black sites. So there was a particularity about Bagram. I, from what I, that's still ongoingly an issue, Bagram. Um, and maybe you could speak to that. Um, there's a lot on the table, obviously. And one thing that struck me between what Andy was saying about the federal court system and what Deborah was saying was uh, uh, something that William Kunstler said in a film called Disturbing the Universe, which is fabulous, but there's a piece near, near the end of it where he talks about the fact that more people have been executed through the semblance of legality than people outside of legality, you know? So, I mean, it just gave me that parallel to what both of you were talking about, both this bullshit military commissions and even the bullshit everyday operations of the United States legal system. Um, and I guess, I would just add, you know, I don't know particularly if other people were on the front lines of Ferguson here. I was. Uh, I know some other people here have been in the Black Lives Matter protests. But, I mean, something that really struck me about that, among many other things, is that there is a deep determination among people that this shit has to end. And I think that is something that absolutely applies to Guantanamo, and I totally agree with what Deborah said. We have to connect those things up because this is completely intolerable. It has to end. There's 80,000 prisoners in, in U.S. prisons in solitary confinement. I've been there myself, you know. These connections that Deborah was drawing between mass incarceration and the prisons and assault, and all this shit was part of the U.S. prison operation. Not that there's not differentiation between the way that it's been done extra legally with the military commissions, etc. but there's a tremendous amount of overlap between what they're doing with the gang validation in California prisons and stool pigeons, and that basically if you're validated as a gang member, there's absolutely 
absolutely no way you're ever walking out of a California prison based on snitch testimony, which is like almost exactly parallel. So I'll leave it at that. And thank you for all, all you guys have done tremendous work. You know, again, Andy, nobody has publicized the real story about the men in Guantanamo that you have, so just thank you. Uh, we're going to wrap the evening up, and um, we have Joe Scary from the, um, the Chicago Coalition to shut down Guantanamo, who would like to make an announcement. So, Joe. Thanks. So, one thing that people can do is get involved with the coalition. We have a sign up sheet here, and there are many different ways to be involved. There are people who are vigiling every week downtown. There are people who are helping to organize monthly informational events. There are people who are involved in a, a very big action we did this summer during the Air and Water Show. So there are a multiplicity of ways that people can contribute. So please consider being part of this Chicago Coalition. Um, if you found tonight to be helpful and informative, I would encourage you to keep an eye out for an event that's being organized by uh, some of our colleagues on the National Lawyers Guild here in Chicago. Um, in particular, uh, one of our colleagues is an attorney with the Council on American Islamic Relations here in Chicago. And uh, Korematsu Day falls on January 30th. That's a day where we remember the other occasion of internship uh, of internment in, yeah, in this country of Japanese Americans during uh, World War II. Uh, Rabia at uh, CARE Chicago tells me that the event is in preparation. The date will be probably the 30th or right around there. The venue will be IIT Kent uh, College of Law. And um, Certainly, the minute we get information about that, we'll be promoting it on our website and on our Facebook page, et cetera. That's a great opportunity for us to uh, join with others in the community, and particularly a lot of young people in uh, entering the law profession who uh, can really be a part of solving these problems. So, thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, again, I just want to thank all of our speakers for coming out tonight. And like Joe said, and I think our speakers spoke very eloquently to this point, it's on us, okay? 13 years, 13 years, way too long. Our, the ruling forces of this country have no interest in providing justice for these men who have been treated so unjustly. And so it's us, the people of conscience, that have to shut down Guantanamo and end indefinite detention. Thank you again, Deborah, Andy, and Candace.